All right, guys, we're going to be talking about chapter 18, lessons 3, 4, and 5 today. It's the second half of the chapter. And what we're going to be really discussing is um, the bulk of the Civil War and a lot of the battles that lead us to the end of this period. We covered the first half of this chapter in the previous notes packet, and that led us up through the Battle of Antietam. Um, talked about the beginning of the war. Of course, we've talked forever about the causes of the war. So what we're going to see here is kind of the end, and we're going to do a brief sort of flyover. We could sure go deeper. In fact, I think it would be great to cover some more details. We just don't have really have much time to do that for the scope of this class. So um, minimize that. All right. This is the, your notes packet. And if you don't have this in front of you, you need to get it out real quick. If you don't have this, you need to go to my webpage if you can and, and print it out um, or at least <clears throat> pull it up as a PDF on a new tab and, and have it where you could access it and maybe take a few notes on some scratch paper if that's all you have. Hopefully you guys have this back in front of you. If you don't hit pause and go do that. The beginning of this sort of starts with the end in mind. Um, we're going to look right here at this, this image, and we're going to come back to this, guys, and, and talk more about this later in the notes packet. But this is the Gettysburg Address that Lincoln gave at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. This is in November of 1863, after the battle was fought in July of 1863. And Lincoln and some other folks came to dedicate this cemetery. Lincoln's speech was 272 words, short and sweet. And it's considered, um, at, by most, it's considered to be one of the greatest orations in our history. It, it's just to the point, and it's eloquent, and it's beautiful. At the time that it was given, it was debated. Some thought that it was kind of a joke because it was pretty short. Another man that was there spoke for over two hours, and his speech, of course, is not remembered at all. The one that's remembered is the one that was so eloquent and short and to the point. And it's somewhat famous. Many schools, many people will have um, classes like yours memorize this speech, which I think actually would be really cool. Um, we may talk about that later. But it is it is something that you guys need to know and certainly need to hear and moreover need to really understand. It says four score and seven years ago. That's a that's a time period, guys. Score is, is an amount of time. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you guys bonus points. Look up and see how long ago that was because he gives you a clear indication here. It says, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we're engaged in a great civil war testing whether this that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. This last paragraph is so, it, it's just so deep and so profound. Listen to the words. It says, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It's for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. A lot of people cite these last few sentences right in here. They say that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. A lot of people cite that line right there with the new birth of freedom as sort of a new beginning for our country, equally profound to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And in some ways, I think they're right because... With the conclusion of this war, specifically with this battle, we really turn a corner as a nation and things begin to change and we begin to see the nation that we currently live in with the greater hope of freedom for all that did not exist prior to this war. And so we're going to see 
just so much of these words, I hope, um, throughout the story today. This is one of the few photographs of the speech being given. Somewhat chaotic, I know. Um, it actually, as I understand it, there is a bit of a stage here. It's just hard to tell that from the photo. And on, on the stage, these men that are up here on this raised portion, if you can tell that they're somewhat raised up, you, you see right here in the middle, you see Lincoln with his hat taken off, his head slightly bowed, giving his speech. Why is it so crowded? Why, why is it so difficult? It doesn't exactly look like um, what you might expect for this type of moment. Well, remember, guys, there was no sort of electronic amplification. They, they didn't have the ability to step up to the mic. You know, so what they're doing is they're crowding in to hear what is said. And, and there, guys, there's a huge crowd of folks here. It, notice the notice the attire, notice the dress. It's a formal occasion. And this is one of the few photographs right here of the speech being given. We're going to come back again. We're, we're beginning with the end of mind today. Um, we're going to cover the Battle of Gettysburg. We're going to cover the final events of the war. We, we actually ended the last notes packet um, with regard to the war somewhere right around the Battle of Antietam. And then we talked about the Emancipation Proclamation. So we're not quite halfway through the actual the actual civil war and man i tell you again this is a flyover guys we're we're scratching the surface um really wish that we could spend more time and and perhaps we will in some separate studies but this is what's um with with regard to your curriculum this is what's in the rest of the war so we're, we're in pages 502 to 537 in your book second half of chapter 18 and we're going to cover a few things sort of randomly here and then we're going to get into the narrative of the war a little side story that's really interesting and has been talked about in literature and even movies um, was how these enemy soldiers lived during the war, how the things that they struggled with, the, the way that they were treated with by, by each side. And many of them, aside from being dead or wounded, many of them were captured. Casualties are considered to be dead, wounded or captured. So if you were a captured soldier, what happened to you? Well, these folks were not always treated just real well. It seems like we say that a lot in this class. Here's a couple of famous examples. There was a prison camp in Georgia known as Andersonville. They would take these Union soldiers that were captured. This has actually only really occurred towards the end of the war. The Andersonville camp was only open for about 14 months, a little, little over a year. And they were taking these Union soldiers and they were trying to put them into some sort of camp away from the battlefield so that they couldn't rejoin the fight. They built this camp. I'm going to flip over here to a different page. This is the National Park Service page about the Andersonville prison. And this is considered a historical style, of course. So the, the government keeps up with it as a national park these days. They, they took these folks that were Union prisoners and they put them into this camp in Georgia. The South called it. They didn't refer to it as Andersonville all the time. Sometimes they called it Camp Sumter. It was operation 14 months. During that time, about 45,000 Union soldiers were in prison there. Now, that's not all at once. That's the number that came through that camp at one time or another. Um, if you will go back with me right here, the, the prison was built to hold 10,000. They brought in something like 400 a day. And the size of this thing is just, it's ridiculous. The person, excuse me, the prison site initially covered approximately 16 and a half acres of land. It was then enlarged in June of 64 to 26 and a half acres of land. Guys, we're, we're talking 400 people a day being brought in. At one point in August of 64, 33,000 people were crammed into 26 acres. This is ridiculous. As you can imagine, people that lived in here, there's no sanitation. There's no running water. There's no, um, obviously not a lot of food. This was a really rough existence. Um, it says by June of 64, 26,000 prisoners were confined in a stockade designed to house to only 10,000, as we just said. The largest number held at one time was 33,000. <clears> Here's a great quote to describe the conditions. It says the camp was covered with vermin all over, meaning rats and filth and horrible things. Okay, Vermin would be like rats and mice and cockroaches. You could not sit down anywhere. You might go and pick all the lice off of you and sit down for half a moment and get up and you would be covered with them. In between these two hills, 
meaning as, as this little map shows, there was sort of a, a, a higher elevation area on either end with kind of a low swampy area in the middle, sort of a creek that ran through it that became pretty filthy. It says between these two hills, it was very swampy, all black mud. And where the filth was emptied, it was all alive. There was a regular buzz there all the time. It was covered with large white maggots. Ugh, imagine. Yes, pretty awful. The men slept in shallow holes in the ground. All they received to eat each day was salt, three tablespoons of beans, eight ounces of cornmeal. Um, that was a regular ration for, for a day. Doesn't sound like much to me. They drank and cooked with water from a stream. Again, the same stream um, as the Park Service indicates here sort of runs through the middle of camp. You would go there to get your water. That stream was also, of course, their sewer. Not a good deal. Um, about 13,000 Union prisoners died there, mostly from disease. Notice the stats here, guys. You're, you're talking a grand total throughout those 14 months um, of about 40, says it up here, 45,000 soldiers were in prison there and 13,000 died from disease. Guys, it's like one out of four are going to die. So your chances of getting out of there, not real good. This is not the only one of these, and not to say it was the worst necessarily, although Andersonville has quite a stigma about it. The Union prison in Elmira, New York, which says was no better. Your book talks about this. It says that captured soldiers from the South were put into Elmira without blankets or warm clothes. Guys, New York gets cold more so than Georgia, I promise you. It says the hospital was located in a flooded basement pond within the compound served as both a toilet and garbage dump. One, again, about 25% of people died there, mostly from disease. These conditions, guys, are just, they're just awful. These are two examples. There's many others. New thought. Moving on. There was a lot of things going on in addition to the fighting that are very noteworthy and contribute to our understanding. Some of this stuff is very political, and we've talked a lot about politics throughout the year. This time is no different. There's going to be um, some incredible political stories that come about. Not everybody's in support of what's happening, of course. Lincoln's, Lincoln's courage to withstand this is incredible to me because he was not regarded the way then the way that he is now. History has really looked very favorably upon Lincoln, and, and it should. And his courage here is amazing. But during this time, there's a lot of people that disagree with Lincoln and disagree with the war and disagree with how things were happening. And here's some, here's some reasons why. Okay. Remember guys that Washington DC, our capital is located. It's on the border between Maryland and Virginia, both of which are considered Southern states, both of which were slave owning states. Virginia was part of the secession. Maryland was not. Maryland was one of those key border states that we talked about recently that stayed with the union even though they were a slave state and considered to be a Southern state. So here's Lincoln sitting in the Capitol and geographically he is surrounded on all sides by Southerners, literally because yes, Virginia is part of the Confederacy and Maryland, even though they are still with the union, they are very much Southern sympathizers. They still had lots of people there that sided with the South, even though the state technically was a, a union state. So as a way to deal with some of these folks, Lincoln suspended um, a constitutional legal right called habeas corpus. Um, habeas cor corpus, what this is, guys, this is a legal process. It's um, a, a right described in the Constitution that makes it so that the government cannot legally just keep someone in jail without cause. It says that you have to have a cause. It kind of goes along with um, some of these other legal terms that we've talked about, like due process of law, where you, you know, with regard to the government, you have to have, you have to have reason, you have to have procedures, you have to have evidence, you have to have um, a, a, you have to have all of these things together in order to keep someone in jail. Now the Constitution says that here it is the quote: when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require suspension of that. So Lincoln actually takes this right that citizens have called habeas corpus and he suspends it. And the reason why he does that is because a lot of these people that were in Maryland 
that surrounded the Capitol specifically and other places as well, they really didn't side with Lincoln. They wanted to side with the South. And so what he would do is he would say, hey, if you're talking against the war campaign or talking against me um, as a way of control, sort of crowd control, I'm going to throw you guys in jail. And he didn't have to put them on trial. He didn't have to have evidence. He could just keep them in jail and out of the way as long as he needed to. He, he again, some of these people maybe were traitors to the Union and we're going to go ahead and be Southern sympathizers and begin to fight for the South. Some of them maybe didn't at all. Maybe they were just using their right to free speech to criticize the government. Lincoln threw these people in jail. And a lot of people thought that was really, really bad, that Lincoln had no right to do that. Um, it talks about this. I'm going to pull up another article over here. Um, talks about this over here. Um, here's here's an interesting character, Blast from the Past. It says, um, in 1863, Chief Justice Roger Taney. Now, that name ought to be familiar. You guys remember Taney? Taney, again, guys, this is the dude that came out with the Dred Scott decision. You need to know that name. Um, at the time of the Dred Scott decision, Taney is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And so he is, again, remember, guys, the Dred Scott decision, he decided that African-Americans were not citizens and therefore had no rights, no legal rights. And basically that ruling established it, it, what it is. It made it illegal to declare portions of our nation um, to be without slavery. Like he basically said the constitution can't take away someone's property. Therefore, all of you places that want to get rid of slavery, you can't do that. So he, he is not with the president in many ways. And so people in Maryland are going to challenge the fact that the habeas corpus was suspended and Tawny sort of sides with them. Lincoln uses the fact that the constitutional gives him that permission during wartime. And, and he's able to keep that suspension of habeas corpus in place again. And it's specifically article one section of the constitution. Um, and we, we just talked about this. So there's people that don't agree with what's going on big time. Um, there we go. We're going to see again in just a minute, we're going to talk about some more folks that don't agree politically what's going on. Okay. Another part of the story here. Okay. Leading into that new thought. It says both the North and the South had trouble getting troops to sign up. Guys, remember that just manpower is so critical because of the casualties, because of the significant body count. Um, this becomes what's called a war of attrition, meaning that we're going to just fight it out. And the last man standing or whoever, whichever side has some people left at the end, they're probably going to win just because they have more people, which we, we mentioned that the North has a huge advantage there simply by the nature of their population. But both sides are going to pass a draft. This is going to be contentious, which throughout history, guys, anytime there's a draft, it seems like there's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on. You know, most notably um, in, in our day and age, people talk about the draft that occurred during Vietnam and all of the crazy um, war protests that happened then. Well, guess what? There's going to be some more protests that happened because of the draft back here, too. Um, this says in 1862, the Confederate Congress, the South, they were the first ones to do this, passed a draft that required um, able-bodied white men between the ages of 1835 to serve for three years. So if you're between 18 and 35, they expect you to put three years in. Pretty soon they changed that. They weren't getting enough folks. So now they're saying men from 17 to 50. Some exceptions were allowed. One, one notable exception, this is not in your notes. You might add this in the margin a little bit, um, was called the 20 slave rule. So if you were a plantation that had 20 or more slaves, you could choose one white male to stay back and not be drafted. Sort of favored the wealthy. Which again, man, if you're if you're not one of the wealthy, how does that make you feel? Sort of feel a little bit um, shafted there. So another thing that could happen is if you had enough money, you could just hire a substitute. You didn't have to go in person. You could hire somebody to go do it for you. The North sort of did the same thing. Um, again, they're they're gonna they're gonna draft. They're gonna pass a conscription act. They don't do it at first, but eventually they do, and it. It goes on to say men here, 20, age 20 to 45, had to register for their draft. And what they did is they would put your name into a, a lottery and they would pull your name out of the hat, so to speak. And if you got um, chosen in the draft lottery, then you were expected to go. Um, now, there were exceptions here as well. You could avoid the draft by hiring a substitute, kind of like the South, or you could pay a fee to the government of $300. Now, a lot of these working class people in the North, 
they earned less than $500 a year. In fact, that, that sum right there was somewhere around an annual salary or not really a salary, but an annual wage for a lot of the working class in the North. Um, could you imagine giving up a year's worth of money to keep yourself out of the war? And they just, people just couldn't do it. Um, so we're going to see their reaction to this. And in several Northern cities, their reaction was violence. People got mad and they began to riot. The most notable, and man, I, again, this, there, there's been books written and movies made on just this event. It's really incredible. Um, I encourage you guys to look into it further. New York City draft riots of 1863. Some of the most horrible, violent moments um, in our history. And this is coinciding with the Civil War, guys, and it's happening in the North. Again, challenging the old um, s sort of misconception that all the fighting was in the South and the North was happy and lucky and all the, you know, et cetera. That's not true. Um, what's happening here in response to these drafts is that rioters, I'm going to go more in detail into this in just a moment, attacked at first government and military buildings. Um, and of course, they're going to then turn their attention in these attacks to others, specifically to African-Americans. Now, let's flip over here. New York draft riots occurred in July of 1863. Now, we haven't quite got there in our notes yet, but the other thing, of course, that happens in July of 1863 that's super notable is the Battle of Gettysburg. And so we're talking um, these draft riots occurring about two weeks, like in the middle of the month. July the 15th is one of the most important dates there. Well, Gettysburg was fought July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 63. So we're talking two weeks after the turning point of the war. We're, we're seeing, you know, again, you, you think, oh, man, wonderful. Battle of Gettysburg, we're doing great. We're on our way to winning this thing. Two weeks later, holy cow, some of the most horrible things happening. And it's happening in the North. So here's the, here's the thought process. Um, remember, guys, that the North, with regard to um, the sectional divides that began this war, the North was really interested in the cotton growth. They were using cotton, right, Northern merchants, to, to get rich. Remember, we talked so much about the implication to slavery, that the North was really, really um, prominently involved in slavery because of the fact that so many of their merchants were buying Southern cotton, producing goods, and then sending them off to, um, to France and, and England, making a ton of money. And so what you're seeing here is that whenever war breaks out, lots of people in New North in the in the North are no longer making money. And so they're going to begin to have some Southern sympathizers. Um, lots of them, remember guys here, the plight of the Irish and the German immigrants, lots of them are um, looking at the war thinking, well, goodness, if we free all these slaves, they're going to come take our jobs again. Financial stability is causing a lot of, or instability really is causing a lot of division. A lot of these um, German and Irish with the Emancipation Proclamation began to seriously be, they, they were going and having serious problems because they were thinking that the African-Americans were going to come take their jobs. And there was even some times when um, Northern employers were using African-Americans to replace Irish or German immigrants that went on strike, sort of strike replacements. And these folks started getting really angry. So at, with the release of the Emancipation Proclamation, they began to again, protesting. Um, another political party we're going to talk about in just a moment begins to rise up called the Copperheads, and we're going to see their response and how this is kind of implicated here. Um, so when these, again, not just in New York, but riots over this draft begin to happen, other cities like Detroit and Boston, but New York was by far the worst. Um, the first draft lottery, as the first names were chosen, it was July 11th of 63. And so almost immediately as that's happening, um, these folks begin to attack and burn buildings. Lots of them become violent towards people who try to stop them. And then pretty soon after that, we're going to start seeing some violence specifically towards African-Americans. Here's a crazy story. This is one notorious example of a mob of several thousand people, some of them armed with clubs and bats, stormed the Colored Orphan Asylum on Fifth Avenue near 42nd Street a four-story building housing more than 200 children. Guys, this is an orphanage in New York um, for African-American kids. And short of beating up the kids, they took all their stuff, they set the building on fire, and they basically took all of these orphan children and they made them homeless. Um, 
that that particular organization relocated after this and they rebuilt into a part of New York that has now become the the Harlem area. And of course, that area is sort of known with um, a lot of African-American heritage groups as, as being really prominent in the recovery um, of this event. But man alive, could you imagine just going and let's go beat up the kids? You know, how horrible and angry would you have to be or how how stupid and senseless maybe is what I should say would you have to be? Um, other areas of the city, um, it talks about dock workers, people that worked um, near the shore, right? These folks were um, also, right, posing black men working on the docks. And so what they would do in this situation, along with these riots, is they were going to the business owners that dealt with um, black dock workers. They were attacking the businesses. They were burning their buildings. They were trying to do it with anyone who wanted to host African-American employ employees. They took some of these guys that were just maybe free black men or free people that um, were abolitionists. They also took um, white women who were married to black men and they took the violence directly to them. Um, many of these people were hung. The word here is lynched, same thing. Um, some of these people were hung and then they were set on fire as they were hanging. And this is just incredible, the amount of violence that these people were um, forced to endure. And so the official death toll in New York City was something like 119 people. Um, that's debated. Some, some estimates of the actual number of people killed reached as high as 1,200. Incredible. Um, how did this end? The way that this end is really ironic. You have, again, on about July 15th, um, you, which again, we, we said is about two weeks past the Battle of Gettysburg. New York regiments that had actually fought at Gettysburg returned home. And when these people, these soldiers return home, they find their city just being burned to the ground. And so something like 4,000 Union soldiers, they pull out their rifles and have to stand and fire these guns and put down the rebellion that's going on in their own city. Could you imagine fighting in the most prominent battle of the war and being victorious? And then you march home two weeks later to find your home just in complete disarray. Crazy stuff. Okay, let's stop new thought right here and let's start getting into the in the narrative of the war. And this is where we're going to be the rest of the notes packet. Before I do that, actually, should go ahead and talk about this real quick. <clears throat> Other things that were happening, and this, guys, this is not exactly in your notes. You need to add this in the margins at times. But there was another political faction that started to spring up about this time as the same time as the riots and the same time as the suspension of habeas corpus. There is a group of Democrats that mostly were in the north, excuse me, the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, that area. And they became known as the Copperheads. And I don't think this was a term that they chose. Um, it says the term Copperhead was first used by the New York Tribune in July the 20th, 1861. Um, here's what a Copperhead is. If, if you guys are from the same areas where I grew up, you would probably know this, but there's a poisonous snake. It's not very big and it's camouflage colored and it will hide underneath brush and hide underneath things on the ground that lay over it. And if you or some animal picks up that item that it's hiding under, it will sneak and bite you without warning. And it's, it's poisonous and it's really, really bad. Um, where I grew up in Oklahoma, you don't dare pick anything up off the ground in the woods because you know hiding underneath it is probably one of these snakes that's going to come get you. And because of the nature of that snake, people that were Democrats or that at least had um, emotions that sided with the Democrats, this is a political cartoon, guys, um, depicting some of these folks uh, attacking Lady Liberty. You know, they, they were people who wanted peace and they did not... They did not agree with the war. They were typically, again, from the Midwest, even from the North, and they sort of fought against the Republican Party and against Lincoln. Now, not There wasn't a huge number of them, but they did establish themselves as a really important political faction. They, they weren't able to um, change the presidential election, for instance, but they were able to gather some control within some of these Midwestern states. Um, a lot of these Irish and German immigrants, again, that we just talked about in the New York draft riots, sided with these these copperheads um they did not agree with lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus they thought that he was 
um, tearing apart civil liberties. They thought that he was just killing our nation with this war. And they wanted to find a peaceful, like diplomatic means to ending this, which of course I think we're well past that by this point. Um, since most copperheads were more interested in maintaining the existence of the Democratic Party and defeating Rebel Republican opponents for office, politically, they were that's, that's what they were trying to do was to maintain the Democratic Party so that there was some opposition to Lincoln. Again, there was some regional success for the copperheads. In the election of 1864, we're going to talk about it in a few minutes. The candidate that the Democrats choose to run against Lincoln is none other than good old George McClellan, which is his his former um, his former commander of the army. Right, this is the the Union commander at the beginning of the war. McClellan runs as a Democrat. Now he he does not totally agree with the Copperheads' agenda, but they they tend to side with him. So we're seeing here again in summary, and you might add this in the margin of your notes that not everybody is on board with Lincoln. Not everybody at the time thinks he's great. A lot of people disagree with him, even to the extent that our politics begin to form other factions that want to fight against Lincoln. So I wanted to mention that. Now, the guys, that's not in your notes. Add that in somewhere in here, okay? Um, Copperhead political faction. Okay. We had spoken in the last notes packet about um, the beginning of the war and the success that the South was having in the East. We'd also spoke about the Western theater along the Mississippi and how the South was not doing very good. Um, General Grant was winning in the West, but General Lee was winning in the East. And so remember guys that in Antietam, Lee had decided to invade the North that, that did not work out well. He was defeated and goes back to the South. And this leads us to two major battles. Now there's, there's many others guys, smaller, smaller battles, but the two that are really important after Antietam are known as Fredericksburg, Battle of Fredericksburg and the Battle of Chancellorsville. Both of these are going to be victories for the South. Moving on down here, and we're going to skip around a little bit chronologically, but bear with me, okay? The North had struggled at the beginning, well, through most of the war, actually, to find quality leadership. There was example after example after example of really poor leadership decisions um, with the Union Army. And so after McClellan, we're going to see a long list of others that are put in command of the Northern Army. Um, none of them are really super successful. And then finally, Grant's going to be put in charge at the end. But here's kind of how this goes. Um, Ambrose Burnside was a Union commander um, who, after Antietam, tried to march troops towards the capital at Richmond. This is kind of like a game of capture the flag. Both of these armies, again, Richmond and, and Washington, D.C., are not very far apart. Richmond is just a few miles south of D.C. and Virginia. And so both of these armies are, are maneuvering about each other's capitals. And so Lee um, takes the advantage of, again, a geographical advantage of high ground in this one in December of 62. Burnside attacks. And because of Lee's position geographically, he, he wins a big, important battle at Fredericksburg. Now moving forward, because the next one is another one that's really influential. The, the next spring from December of 62 to May of 63, there's a new commander in the north. Burnside is he's chosen, he's forced to resign, and Joe Hooker is going to be the new commander of the Union forces. They're going to meet again. Again, this is incredible what happens at Chancellorsville. Hooker has like twice as many men as Lee. Lee divides his horses, which is somewhat of a no-no. You would in many in many ways that's something that people teach militaries not to do. Don't divide your forces. Lee does this, and he sends half of his command under his assistant general Stonewall Jackson, who we mentioned in the last notes packet. This is his most trusted subordinate. He sends these guys to the Union flank, meaning to the side, and they attack from the side at the same time that Lee attacks from the front. Um, Hooker is confused, even though he has nearly twice as many men as Lee. He's, he's confused by the two different fronts. Um, he does not handle the situation very well. Chancellorsville ends up being a very big dramatic victory for the South again. And sort of the same, the same emotions are coming back into play as we talked about last notes packet at Antietam. Remember guys, at Antietam, the South had a long string of victories. Lee and Jefferson Davis decide, let's go invade the North. Part of their thinking there is that they could be successful enough to get England and France to join the conflict by proving that they were going to have a good chance to win. 
So they, they didn't in Antietam, they were defeated. And so now the same thing is happening again. We have two major vic victories right here, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Lee decides again with this success, especially after the one at Chancellorsville where he was outnumbered and still won, we need to go back and invade the North again. And then that confidence is going to come at cost. Um, this man that we've spoken about, Stonewall Jackson, was his most trusted subordinate. He was brilliant. He was very well known within the Southern Army. And he was actually wounded, severely wounded, by friendly fire, which is kind of a, man, that's that's always referred to as, as like one of the worst outcomes in any type of military campaign. Anytime that you have friendly fire, that's so tragic. He was shot in the arm. His left arm has to be amputated. And here's a famous quote from Lee. He says about Stonewall Jackson, he says, he has lost his left arm and I have lost my right. Meaning he lost his right hand man, his number one companion, his number one subordinate. So Jackson will actually pass away after a week or so of secondary infection. Okay. We're going to, we're going to pause in the narrative right here. Okay. And I want to go through and just look at sort of th this. And again, you might draw a line across your page. Notice right here what we're doing. We're going to go back and we're going to look at just the string of Northern commanders that were unsuccessful. And this is kind of important because these names are, are going to come back around. And I want you guys, it's easy to get confused by them because there's so many of them. I want you guys to see in just sort of rapid succession what was happening with the Northern Army and, and why it was unsuccessful. And this will set us up nicely for the end of the war if you guys will follow me. So remember, guys, that at the beginning, all the way back to the first Battle of Bull Run, the man in charge in the Union Army was George McClellan. Young guy, okay, and we've spoken about him before. He was slow to act. He was constantly worried that he was not, not good enough or not strong enough or that the Army didn't have enough men. Lincoln was upset with him because he did not move aggressively enough. So Lincoln relieves him. The next man up was Ambrose Burnside, which this dude has awesome sideburns, right? He's a crazy looking guy. He gets defeated at Fredericksburg and he resigns. Joe Hooker, this one here. Joe Hooker comes in with all sorts of confidence. He's, he's quoted here by saying, may God have mercy on General Lee for I will have none. And he again, of course, gets soundly defeated by a smaller group at Chancellorsville. And so he resigns. This next one, and we could spend more time speaking about Mead. Maybe we should. This next one's really important because the after Burnside, after Chancellorsville, or excuse me, after Hooker in Chancellorsville, Major General George Meade is put in command. Now, when Meade, and, and again, the PDF document cuts off the bottom half of the picture, but there's Meade. He gets put in command three days before the most decisive battle of the entire war, before Gettysburg. And we're going to talk about Gettysburg in just a minute. And it's interesting that the North wins that battle. Meade has just barely even been put in charge and able, is able to, to bring about that victory. And then he's still relieved of command. And we're going to talk about why that is, because even with his victory, Lincoln's not satisfied with some of his decisions, especially right after the battle. And so Meade is, again, none of these guys, this long string of people here, none of these guys are going to be able to successfully lead the North. And this whole time, Robert E. Lee is leading the South, and he has been able to bring about some incredible victories despite all of their disadvantages. And so this, this is interesting. So picking back up to the narrative, again, after Chancellorsville, Lee is emboldened. He's confident. He decides, along with Jefferson Davis, they decide if we invade the North again and we're able to win a decisive victory in the North, there's a good chance we can get some outside influence, get some help from some of these, maybe these European nations. France and Britain were tempted to side with the South because of the cotton trade again. That was one of their major sources of cotton to these other nations. So there, there's some financial implications here that maybe we can get these people, the South is thinking maybe we can get these people to come and help. So this is what's going to bring about the Battle of Gettysburg. So Southern Army moves north. Gettysburg was a little bitty tiny town. It really wasn't that strategically important at all. The South actually 
what they did is they marched on past Gettysburg. They moved further north. They were looking to go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then perhaps after Harrisburg on to Philadelphia. That was what they were really trying to do. And oddly enough, they moved north of Gettysburg and then circled back around and approached Gettysburg from the north, um, where you have this crazy kind of dance that these two armies are doing. You have the Union Army that had been trying to pursue Richmond, Virginia. And so as the Confederates move north past them, the, the oddly enough, the Northern Army ends up approaching Gettysburg from the south. And so the two have almost sort of shifted sides. Gettysburg is a little bitty tiny town. It had a population of something like two or 3,000 people. It was sort of in the hills of southern Pennsylvania. It's not very far past the border of Maryland. It's just a little bit north of the border of Maryland. And there's sort of an old myth that isn't totally true that the Confederates went into this town in the first place looking for shoes. There's sort of a myth that there was like a shoe factory there. And from what I've read, that's not entirely true. But they did, is from what I understand, go into the town looking for supplies. And they didn't entirely know when they went in there that the Northern Army, part of parts of the Northern Army were already in Gettysburg. And so they, they again, this is new territory for them. They've given up their home field advantage, so to speak, and they don't entirely understand the geography. Lee, again, had been using his geography to his advantage. And now with the invasion of the North, he can't do that anymore. And so what we're going to see right here from July 1st through the 4th is um, a, a huge loss in terms of casualties to both armies. After four days, listen to these numbers, guys. The South has suffered 25,000 casualties. It's dead, wounded, or missing. The, the Union that wins, technically, lost 23,000 men. So we're, we're talking nearly 50,000 casualties in, in three days of fighting. It's incredible. We're going to breeze through this. There is a really, really good um, animated battle map on my webpage. Looks like this. And we're going to post this little video separately so that you guys can access it later on. And we'll spend more time talking about the actual ins and outs. There it is. Um, Gettysburg animated battle map. This is just below your notes. Here's your notes that we're going over right here. If you keep scrolling down, there's a Gettysburg map. So we're going to look at that a little bit separately. So for, for the moment, we're just going to do a quick flyover um, thematically of this battle. But you guys need to go watch that. And we're going to look at that as a separate assignment because it's really important that you understand this. Each of the three days were, were very different, and they're known for different things in this battle. July the 1st, the, the Confederates are very successful, and they meet in the actual town of Gettysburg fighting in the streets. And what they're able to do is they're able to sort of on the first day push the Union troops out of the town to the south of the town. And that sounds awesome, like, yay, we're winning. But what the Union actually ended up doing was taking up positions on a series of hills south of town. And that gave them a tremendous advantage. In, in fact, that's that's the reason for the victory. And we will talk more about that in the, again as we look at that battle map later on. Um, but they retreat, so to speak to a series of hills um, known as, there were several, one of them was called Culp's Hill, then there was a Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, a little round top and a big round top. And guys, those are all different little just geographical structures of higher elevation. And they were aligned so that these guys had um, hill after hill after hill sort of in a row to establish their troops and the south had to come from the lower grounds up against them. So on the first day, again, the, the Union is, is forced to retreat into these hills. There, there's lots more soldiers arriving the entire time. There's lots of stories here about, man, what if this guy had gotten there faster or if that one had been able to reinforce at a different time, what would have happened? Again, we'll, we'll talk more about that, guys. On the second day, there was, again, Lee ordering invasions onto these different structures. Um, the, the one that's most famous whether or not that's right or wrong, but the one that catches the most attention is called the Little Round Top. And there's some incredible stories of what happened there. What basically the, the again, summary, the overview is that the South tried to come up and storm the hill and they weren't able to. And so 
what happens on the last day. This is, again, looked at as probably Lee's, without a doubt, Lee's worst moment. And there's a lot of reasons why Lee may have decided to do this because it's really foolish and, and it doesn't make much sense considering how good of a leader Lee is reputed to be. What Lee decides to do on the third day, after a really horrendous second day, there were about 9,000 casualties for the South on the second day. Lee decides to send all of his, again, his, his basically the, the divisions of his army that are the freshest, that have had the least amount of fighting so far, which was several, many thousand men. He decides to have them advance onto these hills that the Union is sitting on top of over open ground. Just no cover, nowhere to hide, walk for three quarters of a mile and getting shot at the whole way and go and storm the Union front. And this is a terrible decision. And many people wonder why on earth did Lee decide to do this? Because this is awful. And there's some stories that might explain this. Some people, and there's pretty good evidence to, to support this. Some people think that Lee in the previous weeks had had a heart attack and was having some serious health problems and that maybe that affected his decision making. Some people think, and, and there's evidence to support this as well, that after Chancellorsville, Lee was just completely overconfident and that he thought that no one could defeat his, his army. There's a number of there's a number of different things that you can read about this that really make you question why in the world Lee would choose to do this because what he wanted to do again was charge at the middle of the Union front and split their front in two and be able to advance in the high ground. So the first thing that he did is at the beginning of the day he decided to send artillery and shoot at these Union lines, the sort of the term there is to soften them up. What they guys, what they had is they had these cannons that would fire um, a cannonball that would get close to their target and then in the air explode. And the shrapnel from that explosion was sort of like a hand grenade. And that would be something that would be really, really difficult if you were trying to maintain a defensive front and you had all of these sort of like shrapnel bombs going off over your head the whole time. You would, you would be sustaining serious injuries before the actual fighting occurred. It was like you were able to do some of the fighting before you had to send your men in there to do the real fighting. And there's a number of things here that go wrong. Um, one of the little backstory things that had happened with this artillery barrage is that um, there was a factory in Richmond, Virginia, that manufactured all of this artillery for this ammunition for these cannons for the Confederacy. And before this battle, that factory had had um, an explosion, an accident where they weren't able to manufacture all of this ammunition. And so they had to get it from other sources. And the other people that made this ammunition didn't make it the same way. And so where these soldiers were used to firing a cannon and they knew exactly where that cannonball was going to explode to try to position it so that it would explode over the heads of the enemy, they didn't have that ability. It wasn't happening the way that they thought because the fuse was longer. And so it wasn't inflicting hardly any damage. And these guys fired 140 cannons for hours until they've got dangerously low on ammunition and did virtually no damage. And that was not what Lee expected. <clears throat> the guy that um, led, it will at least is um, remembered for leading much of this charge was a guy named George Pickett. Now he was from Virginia. He certainly wasn't the only one. Um, the other group that's really credited here was from North Carolina, and their guy, their leader was a general named Pettigrew. There's kind of another little backstory here that um, the South, even in their defeat, they they are still they argue back and forth who did best, you know, who who got furthest in this charge, and was it Pickett or was it Pettigrew? And most of the troops were in Pickett's division, but there there's also again at the battlefield there's some evidence that maybe the North Carolina guys did better. And so the Southerners, again, in years past this battle, they argue back and forth who did the best. Kind of silly. The official name of this, what people know this as is Pickett's Charge, but the official name for this is the Pickett Pettigrew Assault. Try to politically correct, give the, those other guys some, some backing here. But anyhow, what they do, guys, is they lead thousands and thousands and they attack this position. Um, now, the, the Union guys... They were in a defensive posture. They sat on top of the hill. They sat behind a stone wall, which basically means that if you tried to shoot at them, you had a very small chance of ever hitting anyone because they had great cover. 
whereas the Confederates had zero cover. And as they advanced across this, again, about three quarters of a mile, big open field, there were fences. They had to stop and climb over fences as they advanced and just made themselves sitting ducks. So again, as this charge got close to the Union lines, the Virginians under Pickett, the North Carolinians under Pettigrew, some of those guys were able to get to the stone wall, maybe even a little bit past it. And that really didn't do much, even though it seemed as if they might break through the lines at first, they were just slaughtered. Something like half of all those who started the attack ended up being casualties. Um, there's this, again, st stuff that you read and you see in books. And, and sometimes there's even a couple of, of documentaries and movies that depicts this when Pickett, after the retreat, after they're defeated, he returns back to Lee. And meanwhile, Lee has, after seeing the, the defeat, Lee is just scrambling to try to figure out how to, like, he just, Lee just knows that, okay, here comes the North. Now that we're defeated, they're going to come attack us. And they're going to try to, what, while we're weak and wounded, they're going to try to come attack us. And so Lee is scrambling around trying to get a defense ready. And Pickett comes back and Lee says to him, hey, Pickett, take your division and go set up our defense. And Pickett looks at him and says, sir, I have no division. And the, the emotion there, of course, could, could you imagine seeing half of your division killed or wounded? <clears throat> the next day after the three-day battle was July the 4th. And Meade, General Meade, the Union commander, um, was expected by Lincoln after this victory to pursue them and attack them while they were weak. And Meade decided not to. Meade played it safe. And the next day on July the 4th, there was a huge rainstorm. Um, the, the roads, which of course would have been all just grass and mud, those roads became really difficult for the, the armies to pass over. <clears throat> these, these artillery that would have been drugged behind wagons and things of that nature and the, the horses that the cavalry would have ridden on found it very difficult to travel on these roads. So the, the going is just really rough because of the rain for the next few days. And those for those reasons and for the for the fact that the North actually won a great victory, Meade decided not to pursue them. And the, the South was able to retreat back into Virginia. The frustration from that lack of aggressiveness is what prompted Lincoln to relieve Meade, even though he was successful and he had only been in charge a short time, Lincoln is just devastated because he doesn't push his advantage. And so, again, whether or not that was the right thing to do, um, the, the war will continue on for quite some time. L Lincoln's thinking here was if, if Meade had gone ahead and pursued them and attacked them at that moment, he could have ended the war. And, again, we will never know if that was true or not. <clears throat> but Meade was, Meade was relieved. The other thing that happens at this same time, um, about the same period of time throughout this narrative, in the West, General Grant is, is being, again, successful battle after battle. And the, there was a siege of the city of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River. Vicksburg fell to Grant about the same time. So what you have here in rapid succession are two of the most important battles of the war, both of them won by the North. And that's going to turn the tide. And even though there's still going to be a couple of years of fighting left, a long period of time, like 21 or 22 months of fighting, um, th this is going to be too much for the South to ever recover from. And so with regard to the war, Gettysburg, and with the addition of the Battle of Vicksburg, um, the, those two events put the North in charge. So Grant's going to be, again, after Meade is relieved because of his lack of aggressiveness, Grant's going to be brought back into the Eastern Theater. He's going to be put in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And the last few pages of your notes here, guys, really briefly, here's how the war comes to a close. Grant, again, the description here, and this comes from your book, it says he's a man of action. Another way to say that is he was a cruel and aggressive and hard-nosed general. And so he is going to ruthlessly pursue the South um, into their own cities. And he is going to take the fight to the cities themselves. Um, after the siege, these guys are able to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. They basically destroy that city. 
Um, Grant's subordinate that becomes really famous here was a guy named William T. Sherman. And Sherman, again, is a rough customer. And we're going to see what Sherman does again in, in the Deep South. It's very similar to what Grant does. Both of these guys um, take the fight into the cities and, and to the public. There was a series of smaller battles where Grant fought directly against General Lee. <clears throat> Grant's going to be successful here despite heavy losses. It says in a space of 30 days, Grant loses 50,000 of his troops, which is, holy cow, um, incredible the number of casualties. And what Grant knows, the reason why he's going to be successful is because he knows he's fighting, again, here's this phrase for you, a, a war of attrition, meaning that, you know, we're both, both sides are going to lose lots and lots of men. The North, because of their greater resources, greater population, they're able to sustain these losses. The South can't. The, the opinion of Grant in, in the public is not just real high. Um, again, copperheads and, and people in the North, um, they, they look at these numbers thinking, holy cow, 50,000 dead, wounded, or missing. This guy is a butcher. Lincoln is going to be okay with it. And Lincoln knows that he needs to end the war and he needs to win the war. And so he's going to use Grant's methods to his advantage. In the midst of this, again, kind of a backstory, but pretty important also, um, we mentioned this a moment ago, Lincoln's going to come up for re-election. In 64, <clears throat> he wins re-election over General McClellan. And because he's now in his second term, and of course, U U.S. presidents serve, uh, uh, there's a precedent of them serving two terms. Because he's in his second term, he knows he's not going to run again. So all of the things that Lincoln would like to do, he's going to go ahead and push to do. Um, most notably, in January of 65, Congress passes the 13th Amendment, which bans slavery in the United States. Now, remember, guys, the Emancipation Proclamation has already been issued. but That did not ban slavery in all the United States. Do you remember Lincoln's cleverness with the Emancipation Proclamation? Lincoln basically said, OK, Justice Taney, you want to consider slaves to be property? Well, then I'm going to use my constitutional right as president to claim property during wartime. And, and that was what the Emancipation Property did, is it, it claimed slaves from the states that were in rebellion. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free slaves that were in the border states. That was part of Lincoln's reasoning to keep the border states in the Union. Now that he's in his second term and the war is coming to a close, this is after Gettysburg, this is after Vicksburg, the, the North is clearly in charge um, at this point in the war. Now, again, guys, there's no reason to hold back. So Lincoln pushes for a permanent end to slavery, and they're successful in that. Um, moving forward right here, the, the Union strategy at the end, this is kind of crazy, but important for you to know, was to break the South's will to fight. So they're going to do some things here that are seem pretty cruel, um, pretty crazy. <clears throat> the goal, of course, being... To, to finish the war. Sherman was employed by Grant. He was put in the South and he was told to de destroy everything from Atlanta towards the ocean. This is kind of famous and it's, re it's referred to as Sherman's March to the Sea. Right here, Sherman's March to the Sea. And what they did, guys, is they first set fire to much of the city of Atlanta and then he marched from central Georgia towards the ocean. And everything that they passed, they destroyed. They destroyed railroads. They would take railroad ties and they would bend them around trees. Or excuse me, railroad tracks. They would bend them around trees. They would come across southern crops and southern plantation homes and they would set them on fire. Um, little backstory, kind of interesting for you guys. If any of you guys on New Year's Day, if your family ever takes part in the silly kind of little tradition where you um, eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day, um, what that comes from was that when Sherman's was, was taking his troops across Georgia. They would destroy all of the crops. They would ruin all the food. They wanted to starve these people out. And the only thing that they left were the black eyed peas because uncooked a black eyed pea is just as hard, hard as a rock, little bitty object. It's not even edible. And so Sherman didn't think that those were even worth destroying because they weren't hardly edible. And so there's kind of a silly tradition in the South of eating black eyed peas on New Year's Day um, because that's what sustained these people and kept them alive. That's the only thing that they had left after Sherman marched to the sea. Union troops took food, destroyed infrastructure. 
They killed the livestock. They just tried to ruin the South. Formal end came on April the 9th of 65. Um, Grant, again, had captured Richmond. He pursues Lee to this little town called Appomattox. Um, there's a house. They call it the courthouse, but it's really a house. And they agreed to meet there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on April the 9th. Lee shows up in his formal attire, like he's dressed to the hilt. He's got his saber at his side. Um, he actually tries to present his saber to, to Grant as a, as a like a article of surrender, like a real formal, um, fancy way to do it. Grant walks in in his muddy boots and his tore up uniform. And you kind of see the, the difference in their personalities in this moment. And they're very cordial to one another. Um, Grant is reputed to have just kind of droned on and on talking to Lee about the old days and really with a, just a lack of formality about the situation. Lee, of course, is the opposite. <clears throat> Lee is really trying to be formal, trying to be stately. And what Grant does is really, um, right word is, Grant's really nice to him. Sort of what he does is he says, all right, generally, here's the terms of surrender. Um, in exchange for the South's complete surrender, your officers can keep their sidearms, their small, their smaller guns. Any soldier with a horse can keep it. Grant was reputed to say, um, you guys are going to need your horses to plant your crops next spring. And so he lets them keep that. He also gives up food. These these men from the South were starving. This, this had been a horrible time for them with the destruction of um, the infrastructure and the crops in the South. These, these guys have no food. And so Grant sort of as a way to make amends. Um, he, he gives them 25,000 rations. He reviews them again at this moment as they surrender and reenter the Union. Grant views them as his own countrymen. And so he sort of has a, a way of receiving them back in that's going to usher in an, an era called Reconstruction. And we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. So this was, again, long section of notes. We, we did a, guys, we could have gone much, much deeper in terms of our detail. And, and we will, in, in subsequent days, we'll look at some things to give us a better perspective on what was happening with a little more detail. Um, hope you guys are doing good. Hang in there. We're near the end.